on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program the national security correspondent of The Nation magazine, the author of Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, producer of the uh, film of the, the same name, which is uh, making the rounds of uh, film festivals, I imagine will be released uh, sometime in the coming months. The book is out as of yesterday, folks. We have a link at majority.fm. Jeremy Scahill, uh, welcome to the program. It's great to be back with you, Sam. Uh, Jeremy, uh, this is, your book is being hailed as a real uh, a tour de force of reporting. And um, I, I can just say that, uh, you know, at the break, uh, in just literally seconds, you you somehow got it out of me that I'm I'm trying to question the paternity of my son. Um, to, to it's going to be I, my next expose. Yes, uh, that is. Uh, it was well done because uh, I've kept that close to the vest until the results. I got to stand up for these kids. Uh, I appreciate it. All right, let's get into this. Um, the um, uh, like I say, the book is being held uh, in many respects. I mean, some people are basically saying that uh, your book in many ways is, um, can be seen as the, uh, has, people have compared it, in, in, well, I don't know about comparing it to um, Chalmers Johnson's blowback, uh, which he wrote uh, back in uh, almost 15 years ago, maybe it was closer to 2000, uh, that in many ways you are now reporting on a lot of what he speculated would be the future uh, for America's involvement in the world, uh, particularly when it comes to waging war, and uh, so I want to I want to start in, in sort of um, uh, sort of the, the the broader strokes here. You did a lot of reporting, uh, basically on the ground with the the victims of the dirty wars and those who have been tasked with carrying it out. Right. And um, I mean, just first to say about Chalmers Johnson, I mean, I I read Blowback when it came out, and it, it definitely had a profound um, effect on me at a time when I was really just starting off my career in, or my work in journalism. And um, I'd, I'd covered uh, the undeclared war in Iraq that was raging through the 90s, the economic sanctions, but also these so-called no-fly zone bombings. And people forget that Bill Clinton had initiated the longest sustained bombing campaign since Vietnam under the guise of protecting the Kurds in the north of Iraq and the Shiites in the south of Iraq. And so, you know, I sort of started to see war firsthand under you know, the last time we had a Democratic president, um, which I think is one of the reasons why I don't view who's in power through the lens of which party that they represent, but rather through their policies. And, um, and Chalmers Johnson's book was describing a pre-9-11 world, um, and, and I think that uh, particularly with the events of 9-11, many of the things that he predicted would come to pass did. And I think, you know, in a way, I think he saw something like 9-11 coming. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm very humbled to, to even be mentioned in the same uh, reviews as him. Um, but, what, you know, what, my, uh, what I tried to do with both the book and the film was to tell two sets of, of interwoven stories. One is about the guys who are elite special operators from the Navy SEALs and Delta Force and who work with the CIA's paramilitary division. And then the other is, are the people that live on the other side of these operations, the people that are living in areas that are being drone bombed in Yemen or are in the midst of the blood-soaked streets of Mogadishu where U.S.-backed warlords are fighting against uh, you know, al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, al-Shabaab militants. Um, and, then, and then the sort of spine of the book is the story of, uh, of this American Anwar al laki um, and his son, Abdul Rahman, uh, both of them were killed in a two-week period in Yemen in drone strikes authorized by President Obama. And the kid was 16 years old and hadn't seen his dad for years. And, and you know, that, so the story of that family, to me, is really kind of uh, a, a metaphor for how far things have gone to the point where, you know, we're, we're essentially sentencing U.S. citizens to death by drone missile without even publicly presenting evidence that they've committed a crime. And, you know, I don't, I don't think very highly of, of much of what Anwar al uh said. I think some of the things he said are reprehensible, potentially criminal, and I think he should have been brought to justice, but he should have had his day in court and he should have been able to respond. So, you know, the, 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 the book is the size of a coffee table. You know, there's coffee table books, but the, this book is the size of a coffee table. I was actually uh, having a meal on it yesterday. Um, but basically what I did is I downloaded everything that I knew or that I've discovered um, over the past, you know, four or five years of reporting on the ground in all of these countries and in my interviews with guys who do the actual targeting for the U.S. 
I, I want to talk about uh, um, uh, Anwar Alaki and uh, Abdul Rahman Alaki, um, and and I I also just want to say too that uh, folks can uh, should also uh, check out uh, your interview with uh, Democracy Now because I don't, um, because you you really just walk through just an inc an encyclopedia of knowledge of the timeline of that that of course is is also represented in the book uh but let's 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 a approach this story just to sort of with some of the broad strokes because i know that we we have spoken on this program um uh, many times about alwaki and um and and his son uh, and, you and I have actually talked about it on yes, this program. Yes, indeed. And yeah. but but let's remind people, and and then and then we'll we will we will broaden it out because um, this yeah. is I mean what we're talking about is essentially a new paradigm for uh, American war, or at least that I think is the way that it, it was it has been has played out so far. And in many respects, I think this was also um, a, a paradigm that was set or at least the first articulated with Rumsfeld. And even prior to Rumsfeld in his position as Secretary of Defense, it seems to me that if you go back to uh, the, my, one of my old chestnuts, the uh, Project for New American Century, this right. notion of the United States being a hyperpower and sort of maintaining low-level conflicts around the world so that there would be no... Um, no uh, increase in any one sort of power's ability to challenge the, the, the United States as a hyperpower. Much of that, the subtext of that was that we will have low-level involvement in all of these things. Sort of keep a small group of fires going so that no one fire can amass. Um, give me your sense of, of from talking to uh, people on the ground, were the, uh, the, and I'm talking specifically uh, members of JSOC, uh, which of course is the Joint Special Ops Command. Do, do these folks, were they conscious of the change in a paradigm? Um, oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, the the um, in one of the stories uh, that I tell in the book, uh, you know, I met this guy who. Um, I can't say much about what he did, but he showed me documentation that that made very clear that he was very close to uh, these kinds of actions that JSOC was doing under both the Bush and Obama administration. And you know, he, he said that under the Bush administration that there was a lot of trepidation about what they were being asked to do and where. And he said that um, you know much of it was of questionable legality, and almost all of it was in countries where there was no declared war outside of the stated battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan. And he talked to me about his time that he spent in the Horn of Africa, um, you know, out of Djibouti, uh, where the U.S. has this uh, not-so-covert base where the CIA and JSOC launch operations. And, you know, the, the U.S. right now has JSOC uh, forces that have been involved in uh, the African nation of Mali, where they're hunting down alongside French special ops troops, members of al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. Um, but there also were operations uh, that included involvement of Blackwater, where they tried to set up kill operations inside of the borders of Germany, which was a key U.S. ally in the early stages following 9-11. And, you know, Rumsfeld and Cheney in particular, you know, both, uh, you know, grew up uh, uh, politically and, and with foreign policy perspective in the sort of scandal-plagued, you know, years of Nixon and, uh, and Ford. And then, of course, Dick Cheney was one of the chief defenders of Iran-Contra. I, I don't know if you remember this. I mean, we were kids when this happened. But, um, you know, the, the Iran-Contra scandal is happening, and Cheney was a congressman. And he, uh, he authors a minority report dissenting from the dominant view that Iran-Contra was this horrid scandal and a stain on America, and actually said, this is how we should be conducting our <laughs> foreign policy. And so they, um, they, they take power, and they have this neocon agenda, which you mentioned from the PNAC crowd. And, uh, and they basically embrace this idea that um, a war on terrorism is totally borderless, and, uh, and the bonus for them is that it's uh, potentially endless, and that anywhere where you can make a reasonable, or in some cases not so reasonable argument that there is a potential threat, you can authorize U.S. special operations forces to go in and set up shop and, uh, and take people out in these operations that are called F-cubed operations, find, fix, finish. You find the target, you fix the location, you finish them off. And so 
Once they got the authorization for the use of military force from Congress, which really was a blank check, uh, they just interpreted that as, as being able to wage war across the world. Well, you fast forward to President Obama coming into office, and I think a lot of liberals were very genuine in believing that, I mean, they wanted this stuff to just end. Everyone was so fed up with Bush and Cheney and their wars. Um, and, and, you know, Obama preached a very good game um, when it came to trying to roll back some of the most uh, excessive, egregious, potentially criminal actions of the Bush administration. And one of the first things he did was to issue these executive orders on his second or third day in office, uh, trying to shut down Guantanamo, putting an end to the secret prisons, and trying to end torture. Um, but what ended up happening is that key figures in the kill apparatus built up by Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Bush, uh, like General Stanley McChrystal, who ran JSOC for much of the 2000s, you know, from 2003 to 2008, Admiral William McRaven, who was an original member of SEAL Team 6 and was in the White House on the National Security Council advising them uh, on the development of the Kill List program very early on after 9-11. These guys basically come in and they pitch Obama this idea that you can take the fight to the terrorists, and they get Obama to start issuing these authorizations to go uh, into Yemen, uh, to increase activity in Somalia, and to start operating elsewhere in North Africa, the Horn of Africa, um, as well as uh, along the Arabian Peninsula. And that's, that's sort of where we are today. President Obama has basically ensured that the sort of Cheney vision for counterterrorism policy is going to endure because it now has this bipartisan stamp on it. And, and, and do you think, that, I mean, uh, the, it, it was not just, I mean, it seems to me that the paradigm was also not just sort of a function of uh, counterterrorism. I mean, I, I, I still remember uh, Rumsfeld talking about transforming uh, our military into a sort of a lighter... He called it a revolution, a revolution in military affairs was the phrase that Rumsfeld liked to use. And 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 so we have now sort of these sort of uh, I mean that that's what I guess created I mean uh, JSOC sort of grew out of that. Well, JSOC actually I mean you know JSOC's rise really did happen in Iraq. Um, you know they, they, this was a, a it's like an all star team of the U S military. It's uh, you know Navy SEAL Team Six, which is called the Naval Warfare Development Group or DevGru now. Uh, you know Delta Force, the Army Rangers, and then this aviation division that flew the choppers into the Bin Laden raid called the Night Stalkers, the 160th Aviation. They were actually formed, Sam, in the aftermath of the failed. Um, uh, hostage rescue mission in Iran, mm. where a number of U.S. service members died, some helicopters went down, and there was all this infighting among the various units working on that operation. They decided they needed a unified command that had full-spectrum options for various kinds of assaults and uh, amphibious landings and discrete or covert operations. And so JSOC was formed because of that failed mission, and spent much of the 80s and 90s sort of operating in a very discreet way. They were only talked about in hushed tones in the Pentagon. And um, President Clinton actually gave them an exemption um, from Posse Comitatus uh, to allow them to operate on U.S. soil. So they, for instance, were involved with the raid on the Waco compound um, in Texas. And in fact, one of the reasons why uh, General Stanley McChrystal and other JSOC commanders are referred to in the community as the Pope is because uh, uh, Peter, Janet Reno, the Attorney General under President Clinton, said that, uh, you know, trying to get uh, any information out of JSOC was trying to, it was like trying to unlock the Pope's secrets at the Vatican. So they started calling the head of JSOC the Pope. Um, and, uh, and so then, then uh, these guys on 9 11, Rumsfeld realizes he's got this force um, that, that really doesn't have much to do with congressional oversight at all has an incredible capacity and also has its own in-house intelligence division and so they took they took Stephen Cambone who was this just rank neocon uh, and put him in charge of sort of the alternative intelligence gathering and they basically just said to the CIA like see you later they basically put him in the basement we want. they put him in the basement of the Pentagon right i mean he had his own yeah, they, sort yeah, of a, like office of special plans yeah, yeah. And, and, and and the special plans were the way, special plans were basically to, to make the the uh, the war global yeah, I mean that's the that's I mean that's where the shift is. It seems to me is that uh, that JSOC, which was sort of like called in 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 some respects like you would a SWAT team, sort of became almost like the the community policing element in some ways. Like it, its posture changed, where it became rather than putting out a fire, almost in some respects, it seems like they were sent around to start fires. Well, I mean, look, I think that what ha what happened is that. People like Cambone and Wolfowitz, um, you know, were uh, very political guys, 
and they had they came into power even before 9/11 with a vision for redrawing maps, for keeping low intensity conflicts going so that they can ensure uh, domination of various regions in the world or to keep competing powers um, out of the U.S. sphere of influence. And and so what happened is that you t- you take this military unit that's going to follow orders, that's very good at what they do. Um, they're not about converting the natives to you know uh, the U.S. way of life. They're about killing the natives um, and and basically uh, use them as a very blunt, lethal instrument to implement a political agenda of the neocons. And, um, and so you saw uh, JSOC's budget uh, expand, you saw its scope expand, um, and you saw them engaging in activities that normally would have had congressional reporting requirements, and they weren't doing that, and also would have been the purview of U.S. intelligence agencies. And so you know, these guys really took this, this small a covert unit and and made it the vanguard in their global war and and it went from being the scalpel to being you know the the sledgehammer. So let's talk about um, um, uh, Anwar al and um, and, and the, the, the the just as a figure. I mean, this is a what well, well, let me ask you this. I mean, obviously you um, I don't I honestly don't know if there's any individual in the world at this point who knows as much about. Um, uh, how he came to be uh, assassinated uh, or killed by the um, uh, the United States. Um, it, it, literally, I mean, I think you probably know more about this than any human. But why, why do you use his story as the example of this? I mean, what is it about what was done here that is telling of the broader story? Well, you know, I I remember um, I actually remembered seeing Anwar al laki on um, television after 9/11, and because at the at the time I was working for Democracy Now as a producer, and you know we were looking for uh, you know voices to have on responding to the attacks, and what, we never were able to book him. But one of the people we were looking at was this imam in Virginia named Anwar al laki and I had heard him on NPR, and he was on PBS, and he had been profiled in the Washington Post for a piece about Ramadan, and he was sort of being presented in the corporate media as um, as the go-to imam, the guy who would help uh, the the uh, American people understand the experience of Muslim Americans in the aftermath of the attacks. And um, and and so I, I he was already on my radar. I knew who he was, and I had totally forgotten about him for years and years. And then the, um, the Fort Hood shootings happened, uh, where Nadal Hassan opened fire on his fellow soldiers, this army psychiatrist, in November of 2009 in Fort Hood, Texas. And all these stories started popping up about how Anwar al laki had been in email contact with him and was involved with the attack. And when we looked into that, you know, it turns out that, yes, indeed, they were in email contact, but the emails that, that, that have been released show that Hassan was basically just kind of a pathetic uh, stalker who was like asking Al Laki to find him a wife and and asking him all these questions about jihad and Al Laki basically wasn't responding to him at all and was like oh yeah sure I'll help you find a wife someday and at this point Al Laki had left the United States he had been radicalized by watching the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and what happened at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and also the treatment of Muslims in the United States and was already on a path to sort of radicalization um, when he was in Yemen where his ancestral roots are he was born he was born in New Mexico but his family is originally from Yemen. Um, he was basically like bouncing around trying to figure out what to do with his life, and he started putting out audio tapes and um, and publishing blogs. and uh, And the United States had him arrested in Yemen on a kind of trumped up charge of intervening in a tribal dispute, and he was put in prison for eighteen months, seventeen of them in solitary confinement. And when he came out of prison, uh, you know, Alaki was a very changed man, and he the internet became his mosque. And he developed a very vibrant online community and increasingly radical, radical, radical uh, as the U.S. wars expanded. And um, and then the Dal Hassan shooting happens. Alaki's name gets brought up in it. I think it's 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 quite possible Alaki had absolutely nothing to do with planning that operation or encouraging it. But what he did is that the next day he wrote a blog post that said that Dal Hassan is a hero. And then the CIA had his blog shut down. And uh, and then the U.S. Uh, set out to try to uh, to kill him. And the first time we know of that, the U.S. tried to kill Al Laki was in uh, December 24, 2009, the day before the uh, the so-called underwear bomber tried to bring down the plane over Detroit. And from that moment until September 30, 2011, when Al Laki was killed, um, he was on the run, and the CIA and JSOC were trying to kill him. And the reason, the last thing I'll think, say, Sam, is the the reason that I became so invested in this story is because the idea that you would um, authorize the assassination of a U.S. citizen on the basis of his 
admittedly atrocious, reprehensible speech, uh, felt like such a serious line for us as a society to be crossing. And the fact that only Dennis Kucinich and six other members of Congress said anything about it, they tried to pass a bill that's, that didn't mention Alaki's name, but simply said that the president can't extrajudicially kill an American without due process. Only, only six Congress members signed on to it in 2010. It's like, you know, where were the uh, where were the Tea Party people back then? You know, right. complaining about drone strikes against Americans. Um, but the point is that his father, this his, the, the the Nasser al Laki, was is this upstanding, amazing, prominent Yemeni academic who was educated in the United States and adored the United States. And and the, that family let me into their whole archive, and I read essays from various family members. I was able to interview female members of Anwar's family, his sister, his mother, his other siblings, to be around their children, to spend time with them in their home. And to me, it's a story that represents so much of what's happened, how far across the line we've gone um, under a a popular Democratic administration. And I think we're going to look back years later and say this was a turning point, the, the month that the President of the United States authorized actions that killed three U.S. citizens, um, two of whom were not even on the kill list. All right. A couple of things I just want to clarify. When, uh, for for yeah. folks who may not um, uh, fully gra- uh, you know, be aware of the story, that when you say you were a producer at Democracy Now! and you were looking at, um, uh, at Olaki as a guest, it was because at that time he was almost like a, a, an ambassador that was sort of, I mean, uh, an informal ambassador to to uh, Islam and sort of... He would have been on your show. If it was today and we were talking about uh, what happened in Boston and people wanted to sort of understand if if there's a motivation that has anything to do with... uh, you know, sort of with terrorism or, you know, any kind of an Islamist radical group, he would have been the, a guy that they would have had on who would have denounced what happened in Boston and probably right. said, you know, let's not rush to judgment on who, where they are, but here are the sort of players in the world, and this is what I think is a proper response to them. That's what he was doing. He would have been on MSNBC, he would have right. been on CNN. Uh, it was a different media culture then, but that's, we were looking to book people like that because we were looking for people who were affected either because of who they were religiously or ethnically um, or, or just interesting perspectives in general. And Al Laki was a guy that the corporate media embraced as a sort of expert on how certain communities were feeling and were impacted by 9-11. Right. In some ways, as pushback to this notion of like, there's no imams out there who are being, uh, you know, uh, who are being responsible. And uh, and so... Um but I couldn't book him, but you know who could? The Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon. Anwar Alaki was invited after 9-11 to the Pentagon to a luncheon and actually gave a speech inside of the Pentagon. And we, we have the emails from the planning of that, and the Pentagon officials are saying that, you know, this is a fascinating guy, and he's going to come in and give a lecture about the role of Islam in the, in the post-9-11 world, and he also conducted prayer services inside of the Capitol in Congress. So, I mean, he was clearly viewed in the chambers of power, even in the defense establishment and in Congress, as someone who was an acceptable part of the, the debate in the United States or the discourse on, on, on what our response as a society should be to the attacks. In fact, you, uh, your reporting, you, you think that there may be some reason to believe that the FBI was leaning on him pretty heavily to be an informant. Uh, for oh, yeah, I, don't, I don't have any doubt that they were leaning on him. The question for me is whether they flipped him. You know, I, I mean, this is a, it's a complicated story, and if people read the book, I, you know, I, I try to break it down in a, in a digestible way, but the short version of it is that when al was was uh, first starting off as an imam, he was living first in Colorado and then in San Diego, and in San Diego he got busted in 96 on a solicitation of a prostitute charge. And al himself claimed that it was a setup and that the feds tried to then get him to, to start informing on, on members of his mosque and, and basically being a spy for them. You know, and he said that he, he didn't want anything to do with them. Then he gets busted on a similar charge, and he said that also was trumped up, and, uh, and, and that they kept leaning on him. And, and then in D.C., after 9-11, he was pulled in, I think, a dozen times by the FBI. And it, cause it turned out that a couple of the 9-11 hijackers had attended prayer services at his mosque. But the 9-11 Commission determined that there was no conclusive evidence he had any actual dealings with them of any relevance. But the, but the point is, Sam, that he clearly was someone that had a lot of interaction with the FBI. Um, I tell a story in my book about how he was driven to a meeting by an FBI uh, uh, informant with a, another uh, sort of radical uh, guy in Virginia who was an imam and a prominent lecturer who ended up going to prison for being involved with, the, with something called the paintball jihad conspiracy, these guys that were allegedly training to go and fight 
alongside the Taliban in Afghanistan, but al-Waki was driven to this meeting with this guy who then, by an FBI informant, who then later gets convicted um, and sent to prison for life for allegedly being involved with this paintball uh, jihad. Um, and, and I spoke to, I've, I've talked to people who worked with the FBI at the time um, who told me that they think that the FBI most certainly was trying to cultivate him as an asset. And, and the question that I think you know, remains to be seen is, what, what did they flip him? Um, what I do know is that when he left the United States in 2002, uh, never to come back again, um, he was under immense pressure from the FBI to cooperate in all sorts of activities. And I think that he, for a combination of reasons, decided it was best for him to head out of town and right, so, he leave. So we'll, you know, we may never know. Only the FBI and, uh, and a dead man know about that. So he goes to uh, to London for some period of time. He ends up yep. in Yemen. He is imprisoned in Yemen for eighteen months. And you um, you 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 your your reporting uh, basically concludes that that is when he becomes um, highly radicalized. Um, I'm yeah. skipping ahead here a little bit, but at one point he ends up yep. in Shabwa, which is sort of the um, I South guess the, Yemen. the the and and that's a, around the tribal region where his family had come from yes i mean the correct yeah and 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 at one point he is uh when it becomes clear that the united states essentially is it has a, has an issue with him um because at the very least i mean none of the charges that uh, president obama has talked about have been substantiated in any way in any public form they may or may not be true but he is approached by by uh yemeni's uh security who basically say yep. look um uh, well, tell us, tell us what they say to him at that point and when this was. Right. So, um, so after the underwear bomber plot happens, um, you know, there, there, was all, there were these declarations in the media that he had met with Anwar al Laki, this really deranged Nigerian kid in, in Yemen, that he had met with al Laki, that al Laki gave him his blessing, and that, um, and that al Laki was involved operationally with planning that mission. Um, and, and so in January of 2010, the Washington Post reports that Awaki and a couple of other Americans are on a kill list being operated by JSOC and the CIA. They had to then issue a correction because the CIA said we don't have them on our kill list. So then it was just JSOC that had him on the kill list. Um, and uh, and so they're they're hunting Awaki down. He's hiding in Shebwa. He's moving from house to house. The head of intelligence in Yemen, who is a, a you know U.S. backed guy, comes to the Awaki family, and the Awakis are a very prominent family in Yemen. And um, and and Anwar Awaki's father uh, established the School of Agricultural Engineering at the University of Sanaa. He has multiple degrees from the United States and has you know, very close, long-time friends with USAID people and State Department people. And they come to him and they say, look, you know, if, you, if you don't get Anwar to come back to Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, and basically let us put him under house arrest and we'll treat him well, the Americans are going to kill him with a drone. And, um, and they start warning you know, the family about that. And, um, and in fact, I think the first time that they said that to the family was even before the Nadal Hassan thing. It was in, um, it was in May of 2009. Which, uh, which you know, predates all of this stuff by months and months. So clearly, they already the Americans were already telling the Yemeni government, you know, we're going to go after this guy. So they try to get Anwar to surrender. Anwar says to his father, "I'm not going to let the Americans tell me which way to put my bed." Um, and, uh, and that was the last conversation that he had with his dad. And then he went full blown underground. And uh, you know, he t- he took on another wife while he was underground. That actually, their marriage was facilitated by the CIA. Uh, and that's a very long story. But the short of it is that the CIA used this uh, Danish. Jihad, former jihadist turned informant um, to facilitate finding a wife for Anwar al Laki, and she was from Croatia. And the woman herself didn't know that that she was being set up. She was she wanted to go and marry Anwar al Laki. It was like you know e dating for the CIA and the jihadists. And then she is is given luggage with a tracking device in it. And uh, and she flies into Sana'a, and Alaki's guys pick her up, and they they ditch all of the luggage and all of her things, and she disappears, and then lives her life underground, married to Anwar Alaki. So the CIA facilitated the polygamous, uh, you know, lifestyle of uh, of Anwar Alaki. Now, uh, the the reason why I ask about what that that first instance where uh, Yemeni's intel uh, intelligence yeah. basically uh, said, you know, you're going to get killed. And we're talking May 2009 now. So uh, the uh, yeah. President this is Obama everything has, happened. President Obama's been in. It's it's before everything happens. It's also presumably um, we're talking about President Obama's been in office now for four or five months. Ostensibly, mm-hmm. right? With the the narrative we are to believe is that this structure in which you put an American or anybody on a, a kill list, 
right, precedes the time that they're on the kill list. Right. But, well, that we knew about. I mean, we didn't know. That's the thing is that it often gets reported that that the you know the kill, he was put on the kill list in January of 2010. Um, but I, I you know, it, it could have been that he already was on the kill list prior to President Obama taking office. Um, you know, I don't I don't know of any uh, of any evidence that President Bush tried to kill Al Laki. I do know that he was very much on their radar, and that John Negroponte, who was the director of national intelligence was instrumental in keeping Anwar al-Awlaki in prison and was very angry when the U.S. released him. So I think it's possible that they had determined that al needed to die uh, when Bush was still in office and that, you know, Obama started to intensify the focus on Yemen and made al sort of target number one. Um, but I do know, what I know from my reporting is true, is that the Yemeni government, which was cooperating with the U.S., was telling the al family that he was going to get killed by a drone if they didn't bring him in, uh, you know, in in mid-2009, before the underwear bomber, before Nid al-Hassan, and before the Washington Post said that al-Laki was on a kill list. And I, I think that's, that's, that's crucial uh, to understand a couple of things. One is that the whole narrative that we've been told about, that they have developed this uh, sort of legal framework, is really done in retrospect. In other words, I think that's true, and and and, and that I think is 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 crucial. In addition, also to understanding that the narrative that there was actually sort of a uh, that the, he was killed because he was operational in some respect is also pretty suspect. But I want to go now because, and I want to tie this back in because um, several weeks later. And, and we have talked about this on, on this program. Abdul Rahman al Waki was also killed. And mm. we don't, um, well, g- talk about the new reporting that you've done on this, because this sort of ties back into this sort of notion that there was an apparatus uh, that existed uh, prior to President Obama's um, uh, administration. And then the question becomes sort of like, how did he embrace this? Um, and what did he do to embrace it? But but talk about um, uh, Abdul Rahman al Waki, and then and, and, and your reporting on on how the administration reacted to it. Right, just just for context. So this kid, Anwar al Waki, had three kids with his first wife, and and in 2009, um, you know, in, in early 2009, when it became clear to him that he was in trouble with the Yemeni and U.S. governments, he left his wife and children with his parents, who, as I said before, are totally upstanding wonderful people, and leaves uh, his kids with that family in Sana'a and disappears himself and goes underground. Um, his kids are being raised by the grandparents and by their mother in their house, and Abdul Rahman was the oldest. He was born in Denver, Colorado in 1995, and he was a really sort of um, precocious kid. You know, he had this huge afro that his grandparents and mother were constantly telling him to cut, and he liked hip-hop music, and, you know, his family gave me all of his Facebook posts, and, you know, you see it's just a normal, run-of-the-mill, lanky sort of funny, goofy kid. And, um, and he's, you know, he had turned 16 years old in September um, of 2011, and, um, and did, excuse me, in August of 2011, and a couple of weeks later, he sneaks out the window of, his, of the kitchen of the family home after having stolen 40 bucks, the equivalent of 40 bucks from his mom's purse, and leaving a note saying he, he misses his father and wants to go and find his father. So uh, this, is, this is a couple of weeks before um, Alaki's killed. Uh, so he goes and he takes a bus to Shabwa where he thinks his father is, and, and his idea is to wait there in hopes that his father is going to come and communicate with him. While he's waiting there, his dad is killed, and he's nowhere near Shabwa. He happened to be in the north of Yemen. So Anwar al gets killed, and his son you know, is, is in this, you know, the tribal lands at a time when there was an uprising in Yemen during the Arab, so-called Arab Spring against the U.S.-backed dictator there, and all the roads were closed, so he couldn't get on a bus to go back to Sana'a. So he's staying with his family in Shabwa, and he's, of course, completely depressed. His father's just been killed. They're encouraging him, his family members, to try to get out of the house. He goes out one night with some of his cousins and other young people from their tribe, and they're in an outdoor restaurant, um, you know, preparing to eat a meal when a drone comes into the sky and hovers above them and fires a missile and blows them to pieces. And so this 16-year-old kid and his, another one of his cousins was 17, they're all, they're all killed, and they couldn't even find parts of all of their bodies. They just found, they found a part of Abdul Rahman's head with this big head of hair, and it was sort of how they identified him. And 
you know, once once that happened, and you know, and it became clear that the kid was killed, um, military officials leaked to newspaper U.S. military officials leaked to newspapers that he was 21 years old, and they said that he was meeting with an Al Qaeda militant named Ibrahim Al Banna, who was a propagandist for Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, um, and that you know he was essentially uh, you know with these terrorists, and therefore you know was killed in the strike when these terrorists were killed. Well, what I found out in my reporting is that Ibrahim Albana appears to still be alive, the guy who was allegedly the target. And we don't even know if he was ever there. Um, but I talked to a JSOC uh, uh, planner who was on the ground in Yemen working on that operation who told me that the U.S. did not get the person that they were trying to get. Um, and I subsequently spoke to a former, very senior official of the Obama administration who told me that when it became clear that the 16-year-old U.S. citizen had been killed, that President Obama personally was very upset and disturbed by it, and that John Brennan, who at the time was his senior counterterrorism advisor, uh, believed that it, it, it was too much of a coincidence and that Abdul Rahman may have been intentionally targeted by either the CIA or JSOC, and he ordered a review uh, wanting answers as to why the kid was killed. And I don't know what happened with that review. When I contacted the National Security Council spokesperson, she said she wouldn't discuss it and then you know, basically emailed me a boilerplate uh, response that they always give about drones. Um, but then I asked this senior, former senior official, if it was a mistake, which is what you, the dominant leak is now, that it was an outrageous mistake, um, why wouldn't you just say that and, uh, and, and give some explanation? Why keep the door open to people wondering whether or not you people intentionally killed this kid because his dad was a bad guy that we didn't like? And he said, well, look, we killed three American citizens in a two-week period. Uh, two of them weren't even targets, Samir Khan, who was killed with al Laki, and Abdul Rahman, the teenager. And he said, it doesn't look good. It's embarrassing. So the, 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 as far as we know, they say it was a mistake, but they won't publicly say it because it's too embarrassing to admit. At the very least, it's too embarrassing because it would also be somewhat well, problematic that, if word. there is if there was uh, if if JSOC or some other entity in the uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, government has the capacity to unilaterally decide who they're going to assassinate uh, would also right. be somewhat problematic. And I mean, this is the part that 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 sort of comes back into this. That I mean, on some level, there's a description here and. And, and, and I want to be careful in the way that we frame this, because I, th this in no way is, I, I want people to interpret this as some type of apology for um, uh, President Obama. I mean, I, I had a conversation yesterday with uh, Robert Greenwald, who's done this film on whistleblowers, and he talks about this sort of pre-existing national security apparatus that has been so wed to secrecy that, uh, that this sort of is systemic in some way. But, I mean, clearly President Obama came in with one notion of what he was going to do. End rendition. It hasn't ended. Uh, uh, close Guantanamo on some level, that's more of a, a, a sort of a, there's more transparent reasons why that didn't happen. But do, do you perceive this, I mean, is there a problem that there is sort of this apparatus, this new paradigm has been able to sort of grow without any oversight in such a manner that there is even problems at the highest levels of our government of controlling it in some respect. I mean, when I think of, you know, I've heard, I've heard people report that John Brennan is actually the guy you want at the CIA because he's supposedly <laughs> going to, I mean, honestly, that, that he's supposedly going to pull back the CIA from having turned into a paramilitary um, rather than intelligence gathering apparatus. <laughs> that um, well, obviously you think this is a joke, uh, but but I'm, no, I don't I mean, think it's a joke. I just think it's like I mean I'm I'm I actually I'm 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 like rubbing my eyes right now because it's it's like these guys sell this image of the you know they they they, they in this Daniel Clydman book Killer Capture this Newsweek correspondent you know which was based a lot on these leaks you know Brennan is compared to being a Franciscan priest right, and right. you know. Know, this right. holy figure, and I mean, it's it's just nonsense. The whole thing is just these guys established an expansion of a kill program where they meet on Tuesdays to decide who lives and dies around the world. I mean, it's like, I mean, just the notion that Brennan, who was the key seminal figure in expanding this stuff, is going to be the one to bring it under control. It's like you know, just fill in the blank of what mess of history you want to talk about. And and so this this notion that somehow uh, you know the uh, that there was uh, you know, there is some uh, desire in I mean because it, it seems to me that what 
Obama has done in many respects, and I know this isn't necessarily the focus of your book, but it has done in many respects, is attempt to codify and sort of bring into some type of legal framework uh, the, the, these systems that have been in place. And, yeah. and when you do that, you obviously give it sort of, you, you're nurturing it in some way because then, well, all of a sudden it's legal now and we can do this, whether it's uh, NSA wiretapping, whether it's um, uh, this, this kill list, which clearly predates their apparatus that they have built around it, right? I mean, there was probably... Yeah, I mean, let's, have no, let, let's have no illusion about this. I mean, Bush and Cheney were running Murder, Inc., you know, around the world. It's not like they, these guys weren't doing it. What's significant about it is that President Obama made all of these, you know, he gave the, the, the perception, he encouraged the perception that he was going to sort of radically change the way that the U.S. did it. And what he, I mean, you're getting to the heart of what I think is a very central thing to understand in all of this. They created this thing called the disposition matrix, where they, they essentially have like a computerized system that's going to determine who, who could feasibly be captured, who we need to kill, who's irreconcilable, who could be prosecuted in civilian court, who needs to be put into military commissions. Um, and they, you know, Obama, because he is a very skilled constitutional law expert, is spending a lot of time and his political capital on this issue trying to convince people that it's lawful. Um, and and what, that, what, what they're really doing, though, is ensuring that if, you know, if Jeb Bush becomes president um, you know, or, or any number of insane people that, that are, you know, are going to seek the presidency on the Republican ticket become president, they are going to be fully empowered, and it's going to be legitimized by the famed constitutional law expert, popular Democratic president. That, to me, is a real story that a liberal should be concerned about. Definitely. I mean, this is, you know, what we are doing now is sort of sort of codifying this. I mean, it's it's one thing to say that, you know, during the Bush administration, they didn't have kill list Tuesdays. It was just kill list whatever day. Uh, and yeah, any day that ended in a Y was the kill day for right, them. Right, right. But now what uh, the, I mean, it seems to me, then, and I think this is sort of across the board. I mean, Charlie Savage wrote a piece uh, about, um, I guess it was like a, um, a small book about it that, that seemed to draw the this distinction that um, the Obama administration seems determined to really just sort of create a legal framework for this and bring it under the auspices of it being legal. And of course, you know, you massage what is legal. I mean, you know, that, that is a, that's a very fluid thing. We see it in the context of uh, just when or you don't or do, do Mirandize people in this country. Um, uh, right. and, 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 well, look at, how, look at all these people. Look at the response to the, these, oh, the horrible bombings in Boston. All of these sort of militarized calls from Lindsey Graham and, and people, and, you know, the Republicans, he should be treated as an enemy combatant. I mean, it's it's like the you know the the, the posse has has uh, you know is, is is running around with torches in the streets now, and and it's it's. I mean, I I really get nervous um, about how far across the line we'll go because of of the politics of fear, and 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 if we are going to start doing mob violence and we want to start sending our own citizens to, you know, Guantanamo or whatever, and there are people that are legitimate players in the, do- in the body politic of our country advocating for this, that have actual bases of support, that's really disturbing. It's really disturbing, and I think it's, it's going to change the fabric of our democracy if that becomes the dominant push from the Republican Party. And, and, and for that matter, it also, um, it also makes the question of whether or not we should be basically sending around um, squads of, of mini armies uh, that are sort of stoking the fires and sort of maintaining some level of destabilization in these smaller countries or in, in these regions around the world yeah. so that there can be no sort of like grand response to um, U.S. hegemony. It makes that debate even that much more remote. Right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I mean, you know, the, 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 this whole thing with Rand Paul and his flip-flopping on whether drones should be used on U.S. soil and, and, and everything, you know, I think that the, the, what happened with the Rand Paul filibuster, you know, over John Brennan's nomination uh, was both sort of fascinating and, and important and also just pure insanity. Uh, because when, when someone like Rand Paul is the only one that's, like, entering yes. in, uh, you know, semi-sane 
testimony to the uh, public record about the killing of Abdul Rahman al Laki, for instance, that's a really dark day for our democracy. That someone like that, you know, I, that, that, I saw that filibuster as like 33 percent of that day uh, was sane because they were reading articles from respected journalists into the public record, and the rest of it was just this crazy Tea Party festival. Um, but but the point I'm making is that you know we we need politicians who have some kind of spine on this issue to stand up regardless of political affiliation um, and say that all of this is against the values we profess the country to have at its core. And, and, and you know, our, your, your principles are defined when someone that you actually like is in power and you have the courage to stand up and say, these things that you're doing, no, I won't stand for those. And we don't, we don't have enough of that political courage, certainly in Washington, but also I think in general. I think people are really, truly afraid of what would, hap- what would have happened if uh, Romney had become president. And I think we, we all operate a lot out of fear, and that's, we need to break free from that and, and stand on principle on, on some of these key life and death issues. Jeremy Scahill, um, uh, author of... The, uh, well, now released, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield, uh, producer of the film, which will uh, will be coming out, I guess, in, in several months. And, June 7th. Uh, June 7th. Oh, okay. So yeah, uh, I, I don't know that we've ever publicly announced that, but but uh, I'm telling you that uh, it'll it's going to premiere in uh, in New York and a number of other cities June 7th, and then there's going to be, it's going to be in theaters nationally, um, in uh, mostly in independent theaters, but it's going to have a, an actual theatrical run uh, in, in a lot of landmark theaters across the United States. Let me play my breaking news uh, music. <laughs> Here it is. Wait, let's try it again. Did, we just did that, folks. June wait, 7th. Did you, just find out, did you just find out you had another kid? What? <laughs> this just in. I'm a father three times over now. Oh, God, help us. Um, All right. uh, Sam, it was great talking to you. Jeremy, always a pleasure. Thanks so much. I appreciate you taking time. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Talk to you next time.